feel nice. Feel nice to be back. Uh, I'm going to start with a prayer and we'll get a little bit of background as we uh, start. Because it doesn't feel like the Chagim, the High Holy Days, and she feel that music, right? I want you to begin to feel this time of holiness. I want you to feel what it means to be part of a community again, to be able to return. Eternal God, as the twilight of the old year fades into the night that marks the birth of a new year, we gather with mingled emotions, mindful of life's blessings and sorrows. But as for us, our years are limited. Every hour is precious, and so we pray. Teach us to number our days that we may obtain and attain a heart of wisdom as we ponder the flight of time, the vanity of our possessions and the uncertainty of life. We seek to link our lives to that which is timeless and true. May our prayers arouse within us lofty resolves and help us to give richer meaning to our daily lives. May this be a year in which your spirit will guide our deeds and the love of you will fill our hearts and we say, Amen. In the last couple of years, we uh, learned to rethink what it means to count community whether you count in person or by Zoom or by live streaming. The idea of a minyan, a community of 10 people, was challenged very often. I know many of you are glad to be back here, and those of you who are home and watching, to be able to feel part of community. The Barhu is an official call to prayer. It's a reminder of the importance of community. We only recite this prayer when we have a minyan of 10 people present representing the larger Jewish community. I know we all feel especially connected tonight. I ask you to rise, please, for the Baruch Hu, page 18. Ay, 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 ay. One of the things you can't do by live streaming or even Zoom is to do responsive readings. <laughs> and it doesn't work. So it's an honor this year to be able, I think for the first time, to do responsive readings. So on page 19, and those of you who are here tonight, I want you to be able to hear your voices together. And those of you who are at home, you'll just follow along if you have the machsor as well. On page 19, as I begin, you'll respond on the alternate stanzas. Praised are you, Lord, our God, ruler of the universe, whose word brings on the dusk of evening. The stars above follow their appointed rounds in response to your divine will. You remove the day and bring on the night. You separate one from the other. May you rule over us as you rule over nature. 
Praise are you, O Lord, who brings the evening dusk. <laughs> you. Welcome back. Ugh. We continue page 20, Ahavat Olam. Gauguin, the uh, famous 19th century French artist, used to say, when I want to see clearly, I shut my eyes. Isn't that amazing for an artist to actually think that way? Because there's two different types of perception of seeing things. You can look at a bouquet of roses and they can look beautiful and you see color and you see numbers, you see shapes. But if you close your eyes, you can imagine how they're going to be used in the moments you're going to make special. When you want to remember things, don't you close your eyes? Right? And you think back. Because you can visualize that's how we recall from our memories by closing our eyes and accessing a different part of our brain, that memory part. Have you ever tried to recall a memory with your eyes open? 
can't see it until you close your eyes. Why? Because you can feel that moment by taking out the sensory perception around you of sight, by limiting the things in front of you, we access parts of our brain that bring the happy moments of life, sometimes the sad moments, but we feel life through those memories. When we get to the words of the Shema, those six words, I invite you to close your eyes. I want you to try and feel the oneness of community, of life, the essence of the universe itself in that one moment just to feel. We're going to begin uh, with uh, Listen Israel, and you're going to notice that uh, on our monitors, right, there you go right there, and tomorrow they're going to be opened up into the sides. You'll be able to follow along a lot of the uh, um, additional pieces that we have that are not part of the prayer book. So um, we're going to join together Hazan Mimi in the beautiful rendition of Listen Israel.
Let's join together in the English translation of Behaft on the opposite page of page 23. Together you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. You shall take to heart these words which I command you this day. You shall teach them diligently to your children, speaking of them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down at night, when you rise up in the morning. You shall bind them as a sign upon your arm, and they shall be a reminder above your eyes. You shall inscribe them upon the doorposts of your homes and on your gates. Continue silently in the following pages. Adonai Elohechem Emet. Page 28. One of the things I've missed most, by the way, I love the children that are here. By the way, if they make a little noise, it's just we want to thank you. <laughs> right? Isn't it nice to hear the sounds of the young ones? Right? The children of B'nai Mitzvah that I did here in the synagogue, bringing their children back. That's what it's all about, to be able to hear those sounds together. I love singing, and I don't know about you, that's what I've missed most, I think, is hearing those voices of community together. In our tradition, singing is so important. Moses sang, Miriam sang, King David was the sweetest of all the singers, according to tradition. Zoom actually doesn't allow you to sing together. You ever tried it? is the most miserable experience that one could imagine. <laughs> the most beautiful choir, our people singing on Zoom, will be a cacophony, right, of dissonance. And the idea of singing together, that's what our people have always done through good times, through challenging times. On page 28, these are the words that were sang by the Israelites as they passed through the Sea of Reeds. Who is like unto you, O God? As they sang then, we sing today, middle of page 28. Ratzon ki blu alehem Moshe uvenei Yisrael Lecha anu shira Besimcha raba Oh, 
So, Rabbi Vogel said what it means to have people singing. And this prayer, it's a prayer, it's a lullaby. And so, there's going to be a part for you to sing. And I hope that you will sing it loud and feel the... Shekhinah, God's presence all around you. of page 32, 
Senator Bob Hertzberg, such a pleasure to have you with our community. Watch out for the top step there. It's a doozy. Uh, we want you to, <laughs> it would not look good for us were you to leave limping. Um, you're going to lead us. We're honored to have you lead us in this responsive reading at the top of the page entitled, Peace Means More Than Quiet. If you begin, we'll respond on the alternate stanzas. I need my glasses, though. Thank you. Help us, O oh God, to lie down in peace, but teach us that peace means more than quiet. Mind us, if we're at the peace at night, we must take heed about how we live by day. Grant us the peace that comes from honest dealing, so that no fear of discovery will haunt our sleep. Rid us of resentments and hatreds which rob us of the peace we crave. Liberate us from enslaving habits which disturb us and give us no rest. May we inflict no pain, bring no shame, and seek no profit from others' loss. May we so live that we can face the whole world with serenity. May we feel no remorse at night what we have done during the day. May we lie down tonight in peace and awaken tomorrow to a richer and fuller life. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Senator. Pleasure. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> yeah. Just be careful, sir. There we go. We're going to have opposite page at the bottom, one of our favorite pieces composed by Hazan Stein and accompanied by the talented Phil Gans on Shofar. Not often you'll announce that anywhere. Anyway, Tiku Bechoda Shofar. Tika Tikaba Shofaga do Tikaba Shofaga do Le Khiru Tayanu
I love that piece. Mm. I have to admit, I'm, I'm a little verklempt. Right, just seeing you all here and looking around. And for those of you at home, it's nice to have you with us here. Right? Some of you in your living rooms, some of you are finishing up uh, eating your dinner, some of you are perhaps even putting on your pajamas and moisturizing and getting ready for bed. You know, who knows what's going on. I want to apologize, by the way, at home. If you're on, watching on a 55-inch monitor or bigger, I'm sorry for my head size right now. <laughs> I've been told it's a little imposing sometimes, depending on what size monitor you're on. Oh, for those of you who are here, how many of you is this your first time back in three years? You can imagine, your first time back into the sanctuary in three years, right? Oh, a number of you? Wow. Some of you I know have come for other occasions, special moments. We're still trying to get our community back together. What is the theme of this year? By the way, many synagogues have chosen this theme for the year. It's return. That's what it's about. It's about returning. I imagine that uh, you all have uh, different ideas about what returning means. What do you dream of returning to? Large indoor family gatherings, graduations, cruises, large weddings. I always said you'd know when the pandemic is over when you could go to a wedding and dance the horror with people next to you and get all sweaty and not worry about it. That's uh, what we are dealing with is uh, this idea of what does it mean to return? Those of you who are here tonight, those of you who are at home, many of them are planning on being here tomorrow but just stayed home tonight. Perhaps just being at services feels like part of that return, right? About being back together. But many of you have different ideas about what it means to return, don't you? Some will wear masks and some won't. There are others who are not so comfortable with the thought of returning to a service with lots of people, and so they are more comfortable for this year still staying home. Returning is actually the theme of every High Holy Days. You all know this. Many of you know, but one of the most important concepts that we have, one of the most important words that we have during this time of year is teshuva. Right? Teshuva. And we use that, we mean about returning to the right path in regard to our actions and the path that we are on. It's the antidote to losing our way or being on the wrong path. So what can we learn from the tshuva of the high holy days and returning that we should be doing after two and a half years of a pandemic? Well, I wanna look at another Hebrew word for return. Those of you who know Hebrew will know this. The word lachzor, or chozer is a verb. Lachzor means to return. When you return, when you lachzor, right, it means to go back, to do it the same way as you did before. In fact, the, um, the word that we have for the repetition of the Amidah, if you've ever right, it's recited silently and then repeated aloud, we call that the chazara, the repetition. And we repeat it with the exact same words. Nothing different. That's how many people are approaching return to life in the post-pandemic world. Right? I want to go back to things the way that they were before, exactly as they were. But Lachzor is not the focus of the High Holy Days. Right? That idea of returning is not our focus. It is about Teshuva. And how is that different? Well, Teshuva is a very different type of return. Another way to translate Teshuva, other English translations, would be respond, to answer to reply. Tshuva means you are responding to something in some way. Right? 
the return implied by it means that we are doing something different, that we learn from the experience and we choose to go and do it differently the next time. Whether it's responding to something we said or something we did wrong, the return of tshuva means we are returning a different person. That's the goal of tshuva. Tshuva is about becoming what we want to be, not what we were. So how, how do the High Holy Days take us through the process of tshuva, of returning to something new? There's a mistaken idea that the trial that we come to begins today. And that somehow we stand before God and the trial continues through Yom Kippur when we are finally judged. The image is that we're standing before God on that day and being judged. Many of you, that's how we understand it. But tonight I want to offer a little different understanding of this imagery and I think the correct one. The second part of the Notana Tokef prayer, I'm going to mention it a couple times tonight. The big prayer that we do tomorrow in Notana Tokef, you know that second part of it, which says, who will live and who will die. Right? We say the refrain, Barosh Hashana Yikatevun, Uvi Yom Som Kippur Yechatemun. Many of you know that Hebrew, we do it so many times. To translate it, on Rosh Hashana it is written, and on the fast of the Day of Atonement, it is sealed. What is written? What is sealed? So in the Talmud, that great source of tradition we have from the second, from the fifth century, 500 about CE, teaches us the following about Rosh Hashanah. Quote, everyone is judged on Rosh Hashanah and their sentence is sealed on Yom Kippur. Judgment is on Rosh Hashanah it's the sentence which is handed down on Yom Kippur. What does that mean? It's not unlike our legal system in which a judgment can come by a judge or a verdict by a jury. And then later there is the sentencing. After sometimes a reflection of what are the consequences of that action. They are two different actions. Our judgment is determined on Rosh Hashanah, but our sentence is not determined until Yom Kippur. Today is Judgment Day. Have you come prepared? Have you reflected on your deeds for the past year? Courts in session. How do you plead? As we'll read in that Atanatoka prayer tomorrow, quote, you open the book of remembrance and the record speaks for itself. For each of us has signed it with deeds, our deeds. In truth, Judaism sees every day as judgment day. The continuation of the section I read from the Talmud goes like this. Rabbi Yossi says a person is judged every day. And not just once a year, meaning that every morning an accounting is made and judgment is passed. Rabbi Natan says a person is judged every hour. So you all know that on Yom Kippur, we'll be striking our chests. You know that, right, for the sin which we have sinned before you, and then we go into that long list of transgressions that we might have performed. But did you know that we do this every day in our prayers, except for Shabbat and holidays? Three times a day, traditionally in the Amidah, there's a section that says, Forgive us for we have sinned, pardon us for we have transgressed, and we strike our chest just like we do on Yom Kippur. Every day, just like we do on Yom Kippur. Well, Yom Kippur is the day of atonement. Every day is supposed to be a day of acknowledging our imperfections and working to improve ourselves. We are judged every day by our actions. You all know this. Sometimes at the end of the day, you feel proud of what you did. And other times at the end of the day, you don't feel so proud. Every day, there is judgment. We can't change the past. But we can change the future. So today is the judgment day. We're judged for how we've lived this year. Nothing can undo our actions. 
the process of tshuva that takes place is from now until Yom Kippur is not about undoing something. Instead, it's about acknowledging and repairing something that we can do to go forward. We throw ourselves on the mercy of the court. Instead of continuing to plead our innocence or declaring that we were insane in the moment, we have to acknowledge the truth of what we've done. We promise not to lachzor to our old ways, but rather to do tshuva to a new path. But as we all have change, we all know that change does not come easy. That's why we have this imagery, by the way, of God as the judge, as the ultimate judge. Because we can fool our spouses, we can fool our neighbors, and you might even be able to fool a judge in a court of law, but not the ultimate judge. And in essence, we have to be our ultimate judges. To stand before ourselves. We have these aseret yemei tshuva, these 10 days of repentance to create a plan for change. This is more than just thinking about how to change. More than just thinking. This is a plan. This is a rehab program. This is a self-intervention about how to change our lives with that sense of immediacy. And it's not about theoretical. Specific self-imposed changes. Will we gossip less about people? Will we do better in our relationships with those around us? Our spouses, parents, children, siblings. Can we all do a little better in those areas? Will we find time for self-care? To take care of ourselves? Will we reach out to those around us in need? Will we be more tolerant of those who don't share our opinions. Will we be generous and share our blessings to make a difference in people's lives and in the world? So many people have become disconnected from synagogue and Jewish life during the last two and a half years. Will they reconnect? Many people have become comfortable at home. I'm gonna talk about this more tomorrow without being able to engage. Will people reconnect? Will you reconnect? Can you find a stronger relationship to Judaism? We begin those changes now during these days. So what's the sentencing that takes place on Yom Kippur? Some of you have heard me on occasion address the changing, right, the challenging issue behind the Utana Tokef. Right? And I know most of you here, those of you watching, I, I know that, well, you have your imperfections. Is there anybody here that's worthy of death? Seriously? Don't raise your hands, by the way. And at home, if you're about to stand up, sit back down. Because I can't believe, what could you possibly do, any of you, that's deserving of death? What kind of extreme action? And so what are we doing here if we're on Yom Kippur in that image of standing before the judge and pleading for our lives? What happens if we take away that image? Well, I believe that it's about writing our own book. It's about our own deeds, and they tell the story. So on the two days of Rosh Hashanah, tonight, tomorrow, and the next day, we greet each other Shana Tova, or Lishana Tova, some of you will say, right, to have a good year. But immediately following, on Tuesday night, we begin to say, Gamar Chatimah Tova. May you be sealed, right, for a good year. May you be sealed. May your sentence reflect the changes of the person that you want to be. That's what we wish people during those days. That's what that tshuva is about. And we encourage one another to be able to want to change. I believe that this is all about the kind of lives we want to live. The real lives that are built on relationships and making a difference. It's about a life of meaning, a life without regrets, a life lived well. So at the end of our days, we will say, that our memories are a blessing. Isn't that what we want to say? That our lives were a blessing. 
So for me, that sentence being handed down on Yom Kippur, it's about the year ahead. Will our actions bring us the kind of year that we want? Will our change enable us to be the kind of people who will fully, fully live life to its fullest, to have a better year? That's what we all want for ourselves, and yet we often don't take the time to engage in that change. We can't control what life gives us, but we can determine how we respond to it. So what are our options for the next year? What are we returning to? I don't know about you, but it seems like a different world, doesn't it? Humanity has experienced heat and storms that are unprecedented in frequency. Do you all agree? Like, the climate is changing. For us in Southern California, we've dealt with droughts before, those of us who are natives here. Remember, 70s, 80s, 90s, just about every decade. Have we ever dealt with anything like this before? Never. Snow packs, water tables, lakes that are drying up, dams will not be able to create electricity. And if that doesn't wake us up, I don't know what will. So for us, what is it about? It's about getting drought-tolerant plants, only watering once or twice a week. Those are small things in the scope of life, my friends. What are the big changes that we need to make? We're returning to a, a world that's far more fractured over the issues of politics and social issues, isn't it? Far more fractured. In a world of isolation, some of you are closer with families and some of you are more estranged. We've lived with such uncertainty the last two and a half years. Can we learn to accept uncertainty? We don't like to think about it, but in truth, isn't every day uncertain? We wake up in the morning and have no idea what life is going to bring us. One thing we have become good at is being adaptable. Haven't we become adaptable in the last two and a half years? Are we going to keep that adaptability? Are we going to continue to utilize that as a strength? How do we decide what to return with and what to leave behind? That is a big question. And when we return, what are the lessons that we take with us? What will our new direction be? If we simply go back to what we did and who we were, I want to argue that we have learned nothing. Chuba is about looking back so that we can move forward. I want to finish with a parable attributed to a 19th century Hasidic Rebbe, Rabbi Chaim of Zanz. Some of you may even know this. It's a beautiful, I love the story. A man's been wandering about in a forest for several days, not knowing which was the right way out. Suddenly he saw a person approaching him. His heart was filled with joy. Now I shall sure, certainly be able to find out what is the right way out. When they neared one another, he asked the man, Brother, tell me, which is the right way? I've been wandering about in this forest for several days. Said the other to him, Brother, I don't know the way out either, for I have been wandering around here equally as well. But I can tell you this, do not take the way that I have been taking, for that will lead you astray. Now let us look for a new way out together. The returning we do on the High Holy Days is not about returning to the old path for the sake of comfort and nostalgia. We must seek new paths. These new paths are a result of our experiences, our pain, our joys, our failures, our successes during the past year. What have you learned during the last two and a half years? What can you take to be a better person, to make this world a better place? As we focus on Shuva seeking return, what will be the new path that you return to? Wishing you all Shana Tova. More importantly, a gamar chatimataba, that you should be sealed for a good year, and the path you choose should bring you better life. And let us say, Amen. We're going to continue page 34 with the Hatsi Kaddish. Yit Gadav 
Soviet Kadash together, page 36, for the silent rendition of the Amidah. But we're going to begin with this beautiful Kavanah meditation at the beginning from the Psalms. Adonai, Sfatai, Tiftach, Ufi, Agi, Tilatecha. God, open my lips, my mouth may proclaim your praise. And then, when we finish with that Kavanah, we'll silently go into our prayers, Hebrew or English, or the private prayers of your heart. Yeah. 
page 50, Kaddish Shalem. together page 56 for Kiddush. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam Borei peri ha'gafen Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam Asher b'chabar mikoam Mikolhaamim Udvaracha emet Bekayaham laad Baruch ata Adonai Melech hakol haaretz Bekadesh Yisrael Melech hakol haaretz Bekadesh Yisrael Baruch 
Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shehechianu Vekiemanu Vekiyanu Lazman Hazem Amen We remain standing for Aleinu, page 58. Aleinu l'shabeach adon hagol L'atein gilu l'yoserishin Shelo asanu kigoye aratzot Velo samanu kemishpavot ha'adama Shelo sam chelkeinu kahem seated. On page 66, uh, you'll find here Psalm 27 recited during this time of year from the beginning of Elul, beginning of last month through the high holy days. The top reading or the bottom reading or in Hebrew, whichever you like, as Chazan will share with us, Achat Sha'alti. And Jane. Ha 
Blessed be Noah, be Noah, Adonai, Levake, be Page 64, those who have need or desire to recite the words of the mourner's Kaddish, you're invited to rise at this time. And those of you who are at home, if you're reciting Kaddish, you're invited to stand as well and be part of our minyan, our sacred community. I'll remind you probably a couple times during these Yamim Norim days of Ah that we add a word into the words of the Kaddish, Le'ela, Le'ela, to lift up, we repeat that word um, in the later paragraph, you'll see as a way of elevating ourselves during this holy time of year. Those reciting the mourner's Kaddish join together. Yit gadal, the yit kadash, shemei rabah, amen. Be'alma divrach yirute, be'amlich malchute, be'chayechon v'yomechon v'chaye v'chol beit Yisrael, Bagalav is man kari vimeru amen. Yehesh me rabam of orach, leolam o meo maya. Yit barach, vishtabach, vit paar, vitromam vit nase, vit hadar, vitale vitalal. Shme de kudisha brihu. Leela o leela, mi kol birchata vishirata. Tush bechata vinechamata. Namiran vilma vimeru amen. Yehe Shlama Rabat Min Shemaya, Bechayim Aleinu V'alko Yisrael V'meru Amen. Hose Shalom B'mromav, Hu Ya Ase Shalom. Aleinu V'alko Yisrael V'meru Amen. May God who establishes peace in the heavens grant peace and harmony for us, for all of Israel and all of humanity, we say Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, looking forward to, I hope, seeing all of you uh, here tomorrow. And those of you who are watching at home, I know many of you are going to join us here as well. We welcome you. If you want to bring in your Sova food uh, tomorrow, anytime through Yom Kippur, even afterwards, um, I don't know if we, I don't think we have bags. We may have some. Uh, but if not, you just bring in the food. And there are the containers down in the parking lot. You'll be able to drop them off during Rosh Hashanah or even Yom Kippur. Uh, we, uh, in addition, be able to uh, celebrate. We have a uh, High Holy Days library, if you don't know that, books that are out there, in addition to the Maxarim, and if you want to bring one in and to just be inspired by it, you can as well. That's what this time of year is all about, and uh, just looking forward to sharing in person. Let me share with you uh, a final story. It's a very rich but miserly man who passes away, and he's standing in line at the heavenly gates, waiting to have his judgment. He's back in the line, and he hears the people in front of him, and all of them who seem to have been generous that uh, their deeds are forgiven. And one by one, he's starting to feel better. He's actually got money. And so he gets to the front of the line feeling pretty good, and he says to the judge there, he says, you know, I know I haven't been so generous in my life, but tell you what, I'll pull out my checkbook and whatever, whatever organizations you'd like me to write to, I'm glad to. And the judge looked him straight in the face and said, sir, here, so sorry, here, we all don't accept checks, we only accept receipts. The idea in life, right, what are your receipts that you bring at the end of life? Right? It's not about promises, it's not about the things that you pledge to do. It's about when you show up at the end, what are the receipts of the way that you've changed people's lives, made a difference in the world? May this be a Shana Tova for a good year for all of us. We're going to conclude our service with Adon Olam. Invite you to arise, please, at this time. And Chazanim, thank you, and the choir, and everybody at uh, AV Masters. And by the way, we also have um, we also have sponsors at our gala this past year um, who raised money, who generously gave in order to be able to provide this live streaming. So we're grateful for those, and we'll be publicizing those names during the course of the holidays. Let's join together, Adon Olam.